Are your clients coming back to you with no pigment left in their brows, making you want to scream and throw in the towel? I know you've tried different pigments, you've scoured Facebook groups for answers, and you've made offerings to the brow gods. But actually, the solution to making these brows stick around could just lie in tweaking a few simple things with your needles that will make a massive difference to your work. I've taught these techniques to thousands of artists and it always improves their results instantly. So in this video, I'm gonna show you where you may have been going wrong. And these changes are so simple that by the end of it, you'll be an artist so good that you'll have people begging to work with you. Firstly, imagine trying to paint a wall with a pastry brush. With your feet. Will it do it? Yes, but I wouldn't hire you to decorate my house. So why is this so important? Well, if you think about it, the needle is the thing that's in the skin. It's the tool that's doing the implanting of the pigment. So if you're not using the right tools and using them properly, it can't do it well. So let's look at the ways that you're not properly using your tools. I see this mistake every day on social media and it's so simple to fix, but it will be the number one reason you aren't implanting properly. So let's change it right now. To get perfect pixels on the skin with the minimum amount of trauma, the needle needs to hit the skin at 90 degrees. If you're holding it at less than 90, even 60 degrees, then you implant on a slant and you will get ugly shadowing below the skin. The simplest way to fix this and to put less stress on the joints of your hands is by changing how you hold your machine. If you hold it like a pen, then it will naturally gravitate to a 60 degree position over time. Changing it to holding it like this between your first two fingers, using them to control the movement and anchoring with your thumb naturally holds your machine at 90 degrees. Doing this is also going to help massively with the next problem. I am in so many Facebook groups where I see the wrong information about needles on a daily basis. It actually persuaded me to close my own Facebook group down. Instead, I give free advice weekly to an email list. It's down there. So hopefully it can save more people from scarring. This may feel like the wrong advice, but if your work is coming back with poor pigment retention, it may be down to your needle depth. You see, working aggressively and deeply in the skin causes trauma, which in turn can lead to scabbing. When these scabs come off, it often takes the pigment with it too, but it will leave scarring. So all these posts saying, you probably weren't deep enough, are the worst possible advice. This is how you should test your depth. Put a glove on your hand and use the machine on it and you should feel the needle, but it shouldn't pierce the skin. The glove is acting like the epidermis of the skin. So on a client, we would be implanting in the top layer of the dermis, which is exactly where we want it. But is this pressure exactly the same for all clients with all needles? Well, no, so that brings us to our next mistake. At my old house, I had a large wooden coffee table in front of my sofa and a mirror on the wall behind it. I bought some killer new jeans and had the spikiest stiletto shoes on. These, in fact. I love you. I wanted to see how they looked together, so I climbed up onto the coffee table and strutted about up there looking at my fabulous purchases. Only when I got down, I'd left hundreds of dents in the softwood table. Oops. And this is where you may be going wrong with your needles. Let's stick with shoes because, well, because I love them. I love you. I want you to imagine you're at a wedding outside in a field and you have a spiky pair of stilettos on. How confident are you walking on that grass that you're not gonna end up going through the soil making a hole in it? Not confident, eh? What if you're wearing a block heel? You might make a mark on the grass, but you're not going through the soil. And what if you're a casual type guest who wore sneakers? Well, you're definitely not going through the soil. In fact, to make a mark on the grass, you might have to jump on it a bit. And it's exactly the same with needles. A 1RL 0.25 is this spike shoe. 0.35 is this slightly bigger stiletto. And a 3RS is a block heel. And this massive magnum needle is your sneakers. The more needles in a configuration, the more pressure is spread across them, meaning the less likely you are to traumatize the skin, but also the more pressure you have to put on as they go larger. You need to ask yourself three questions. What needle is it, or shoe? Who am I? Am I heavy or light-handed? I mean, I really shouldn't have danced on that table. If I'd have tiptoed on it, it would have been fine. And what surface am I working on? Someone with robust young skin can handle the spiky 1RL, 
but an older lady with thin skin is gonna need something softer like a three or five RS so you don't damage it. If someone is showing the signs of trauma, say excess lymph or bleeding, then always change your needle for something bigger and less sharp like a shader. Which again, leads us to a needle problem you might not be aware of. So we know that if the weather's been hot for this wedding, then the soil might be firm and we probably won't damage it. And if it's been raining for weeks, which it always does here, damn it, <laughs> then those spiky shoes better go back in the cupboard because we'll tear that ground up. But what if all of that weather happened at the same time? Well, that is the reality of tattooing people's faces. Look at these brows that came to me the other day. She wanted them covering. If the whole brow was like the front, then I probably could have done that. But the tails were a different story. And unfortunately, we had to perform saline removal on them. The skin is different thicknesses all over the face. And the mistake I so often see is people treating it all the same. The skin at the tails of the brows is 60% thinner than the fronts. Here are the danger areas of piercing the dermis and blowing out on the brows. With lips and eyeliner, the skin is so much thinner, so you may have to change your needles or at the very least, your pressure. So we're all good on angle, pressure, needle type and skin type. Well, even after sorting all this out, you may still be damaging your results by using the wrong type of needle. You said we'd sorted out the type of needle. Yeah, I know, sorry. But this difference is one I haven't seen anyone else talk about and it's so important. Let's look closely at the tip of these needles. Can you see the difference? This one is what's called a closed tip needle. And this one here has a section missing on the tip. Do you know what this scoop is for? This is an open tip needle and they are both designed to achieve different results. This closed tip needle is totally encased in plastic so it's very stable. This means that it's great for techniques where we need the needle not to be flexible. So I'd use this for lining lips and they're amazing for nano strokes where we want the needle to draw hairs with no wobbly bits. But what if we want beautiful shading? So the scoop that's missing allows this needle to move and bend more. So when you're using a movement like whip shading, the needle can be flexible. If you use a liner needle to shade, then it's gonna cause the needle to keep hitting the casing, making abrupt movements in the skin, which you've guessed it, leads to more trauma. So if you're lining, use a closed tip needle, and if you're shading, use an open tip needle. But of course these needles are gonna behave differently in different machines, especially if you use a very soft hit or a very hard hit machine. These are gonna give you such drastically different results, so you really, really need to understand how your machine works alongside these different needles. And that's why you need this video next to make you a PMU, a machine expert. This is going to take me ages.